on. God's got something for you today. If you haven't already got what you need, don't worry. We're just getting started. God's got a miracle for you. I want you to high five three or four people and, and head back to your seats. Don't sit down yet. I'm going to get you sitting in just a minute. I know you've been worshiping for a long time. We're going to get you sitting down in just a minute, but I want to read some scripture to you this morning. Grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. Thank you, Jesus. Can you give this great worship team just a hand clap of appreciation today? Come on, come on. It's so good to see you remain standing for the reading of the word. I'm going to continue with our series today called Our Father. We're going to finish up talking about the Lord's Prayer. And I'm just telling you, today is the day of freedom for somebody in this place. If you haven't already got your freedom, don't worry. It's on the way. God knew you was going to be here. If you're one of our first-time guests or maybe second-time guests, we just want to say we recognize you. We're proud of you. We're grateful that you're here today. Can you give them some love all over the room, Lighthouse? Thank you for being here. Grab your Bibles and head over to Ruth, a small book of Ruth with a impactful and very important story I want to share just a little bit from that as you're turning there let me give you some plugs really quick some uh, just a few moments my mom Kathy is going to come up she's going to give you some announcements tell you about some important things going on but I got to tell you in two weeks we have Easter two weeks from today come on amen okay let's try that again in two weeks is Easter Sunday morning it's going to be the most impactful. It's going to be the best Easter we've ever experienced. But everybody has to do something. This is not a get out of jail free card time. Everybody has to do something. So if, as soon as the service is done at the Welcome Center, there will be an opportunity for you to sign up to do something. My mom is going to share more with that. I'm still getting used to saying my mom from the platform. It's kind of a weird thing. It's like every week is bring your mom to work week. Uh, She's going to be sharing a little bit more about that. The biggest thing that you can do to help us is we have invitation cards that you're going to get put in your hand when you leave. They are not for you to put in the trash can in your car or to lose in your pocket or to wash in the laundry. They're for you to invite somebody to come. They will come if you invite them. It's like that movie. If you build it, they will come. If you invite them, they will come. Also, men of God, we have our stand conference coming up in just a few weeks. If you sign up today from noon to midnight, you save 20 bucks. So do that. You can get more information about that at the Welcome Center. I know you've been staying, and I'm going to get you sitting down. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. Ruth chapter 1, verse 19. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened that when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Let me give you some context. They left home. They lost everything. They came back. End of context. What a sad story. Well, Pastor Josh, you're so encouraging this morning. Hang with me. Verse 20. But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Everybody say Mara. Somebody's going. He's already talking about the day after today. For the Almighty has dealt with me very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. Don't call me Naomi anymore. That's not my name. My name is Mara because the Lord has dealt very bitterly. Say the word bitterly. Now let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. We've been reading the Lord's Prayer together. Miss Lisa is going to put it up on the screen. Will you, with everything that you have, say the Lord's Prayer with me? In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven. Come on. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Come on, everything you got. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're with us even now. We pray your will to be done. We pray your kingdom to be done on earth, in this room, as it is in heaven. May heaven touch earth today. Father, if there's any Josh on this message, take it off. We don't want to hear from me, my thoughts, opinions, or views. We want to hear what your word says. We want to hear what you say. Help us that when we hear your word, to do what it says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, fist bump two people. You've high-fived some people. You've hugged some people. Now you're going into the fist bump. And you may grab your seat. God bless you. Thank you. It is so good to see all of you. Thank you, Miss Joy. Well done today. We appreciate you. As I had said, today we are going to finish our series. We've been praying and believing and talking about the Lord's Prayer. Isn't it interesting that the disciples could have asked Jesus to teach them anything, but they asked Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus began to teach them how to pray. He used the Lord's Prayer as a model. When Jesus was praying, forgive us our debts, that doesn't mean Jesus had debts. It means that he was modeling, this is how you pray. And so we've been talking about how important it is to pray the same way that Jesus prayed. Now, Jesus wants you to just talk to him like you're talking to God, like you're talking to your father. He just wants you to communicate to your father. So there's no fancy. You don't have to come. I, I've seen some people when they pray, they don't talk the same way that they talk when they're talking to me. They, they put on a weird voice. Oh, thou is the Lord art. And they start reciting the only hymn that they know. And amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And they just start reciting. You don't got to pray like that. You don't got to do a fancy voice. You just have to talk to your father. But in the same way that two people can be fishing, one person may be better at fishing than others, and they just catch more fish. That doesn't mean that, that God hears your prayers any different, but the way that we pray does make a difference. I'm going to be highlighting today the Lord's Prayer. We're going to put it in fast-forward mode. I could preach the Lord's Prayer for, for the, a 10-week series and only just get started, but I realize many of you don't have the capacity in your ears or your sitting instrument to deal with me talking that long. So we're going to fast forward through the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to hit some highlights for you, and then I'm going to preach to you in just a moment at the end, and your eyes are going to be open to, to a very important truth about prayer. But first, let's begin at the beginning, the Lord's Prayer model. When you leave here today, I'm going to be putting in your hands a blue paper. This blue paper is a prayer model that you can take home. How many are just, you know that you ought to pray, but learning how to pray is still a struggle for you? Where are you at? Okay, it's a lot more than those who raise your hand. I'm going to forgive you for lying already this morning. We've been here for just a few moments and you're already lying. Lord, forgive them for lying. Lord, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I'm going to put in your hands the Lord's Prayer model. And this is going to be something that you want to take home and put wherever you pray. And this is going to help you to pray. So you're going to get one of these. If I find them in the parking lot, I'm going to look at the security cameras to figure out who threw it down. I'm coming after you. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. We want to pray the prayers, pray the same way that Jesus prayed. Amen. So we know that, number one, Jesus started with identity. He started with praise. Our Father, he said, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He started with praise. We can begin our prayer with praise. We praise God for who he is. How do we know who he is? It's revealed by his name. Let me give you some names of God from the Bible. God is El Olim, everlasting and eternal. He is Yahweh, which means self-existent. He is El Elyon, which means most high. He is El Shaddai, which means almighty. He is Agape, that means love. He is Jehovah Rapha, which means healer. How many have needed Jesus to be your healer before? 
He is Jehovah Shalom, which means peace. How many has God brought you peace? We were standing, Pastor and I went Friday morning to go be with our friends, Pastor Matt and Courtney, and we were standing in just the devastation that that tornado left at that church building right there, right off of 27 in Winchester. And we're standing there and just the demolished, the, the, just the scene all around just looked horrible, just could not understand, just could not believe. And Pastor Matt was on the phone, and uh, we had got there, and I was kind of just standing there praying and kind of walking around just looking at the devastation while he was on his phone. He hung up his phone, and he came over and gave me a big hug, and he says, I'm going for an open concept, Phil. What do you think? (laughs) And I said, Pastor Matt, I got to tell you, I'm not trying to be critical of your church, but it looks like the cleaning person has not been here, and they need to vacuum this floor out. This looks... And in the middle of that devastation, when we prayed, I felt the shalom, the peace of God come over that property. And how many have ever experienced something like that? You have no business having peace, but the shalom, peace of God has come over you. Amen. That's who he is. He's Jehovah Shaphat, which means all-knowing. He's the judge in wisdom. Jehovah Shama, which means he's ever-present. Come on, Jehovah Nisi means he is victorious. Jehovah Kadash means he's holy. Jehovah Sid Kanu, which means he's righteous. Jehovah Roah, which means he's a shepherd. Jehovah uh, Seboth, which means he's the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Jireh, which means he's my provider. That is who he is, amen. So when we pray, may your name be kept holy, what we are saying is you are all of these things that your name represents. You are all of them. So we know we should pray according to his name. Number two, we should pray according to his mission. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you today, whose kingdom are you trying to build? Whose kingdom? What are you trying to advance? Are you advancing your own thoughts, your own kingdom, your own preferences? Or are you advancing God's kingdom today? So we've talked about the importance of praying according to God's mission. If you're in the room, say amen. We want to pray, number three, write these, if you're not writing down, I'm going to, now you have to watch it on Facebook and go back and get the first two, because I'm not going back. I'm moving ahead. I'm, I'm moving forward and only forward, baby. But you better catch up, but you can have number three. I'll give you that one for free. Write this down. I love you. You're so awesome. Some of you, I say, write this down, and I know you're not writing it down because you go like this. They're not writing it down because, first of all, there's nothing in their hands. There's no paper. There's no phone. Second of all, they didn't even hear that because they're going, I love you. You're not going to get any better, but I love you. I'm trying to help you today. So, number three, we, we pray according to provision, God's provision. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not give us this day the speedboat we've been hump, hunting for. Our daily bread. There's nothing wrong with a speedboat, but if you're going to get one, you might as well buy two and give one to your pastor. Bless the Lord. (laughs) Thank you, Father. (laughs) Are you praying according to the needs in the areas of your family, of your school, of your bills, of the food that you need, of your job, of your church? Are you trusting the Lord or are you building your own kingdom and hoping that you will get all the freebies along the way. Number four, when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Should I go back? I'll go back. I love you too much to let you flow it out there. Number one, we pray according to praise. Number two, we pray according to mission. Say mission. Number three, we pray according to provision. Say provision. Number four, we pray for forgiveness. We pray for forgiveness. Say forgiveness. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors are you asking the Lord to forgive you one of the most uh, uh, humbling prayers you could ever pray is father in my mind in my mind's eye right now would you just reveal in my heart the areas that I have not put you first in are there sins in my life are there things that I've done that I didn't even know that I've done have I hurt somebody or offended somebody Have I had a bad attitude towards somebody? 
When's the last time you took yourself before the Lord as Jesus described that tax collector and you beat your chest and you said, God, I'm a sinner. What areas of my life have I missed the mark in? What areas of my life do I need to get better in? God, reveal to me. Father, show me my sins. Forgive me of the things that I've done. I would encourage you, if you don't know what to pray, always start with repentance. That's always a good place to start. I was, every year, Pastor and I go away for a few days to a prayer retreat. And we never reveal or talk about anything that people pray for or that people, pastors, are believing for. But I remember one year we were at the prayer retreat and you, there's no agenda. You just get there and you just begin to pray and see what God wants to do. And they, we were all looking at each other and they said, okay, where, where do we start? And a pastor stood up and said, I don't know where to start. But I know I can always start with repentance. And those pastors begin to pour out their hearts before the Lord about the areas of their struggle and about the areas of their weakness. And the Holy Spirit began to move in that room. When you don't know what to start, just start the prayer. Father, forgive me. So we, that's number four. Number five, we pray for protection. And lead us not into temptation. Come on. But deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Come on. When is the last time those precious babies of yours are laying in their beds and you just go creep in there nice and quiet mom and dad and you just begin to pray over them and Lord protect them Jesus protect their minds God protect them Jesus keep them safe God Lord I pray protection over our kids in fact I just feel like you've been sitting a long time it's about time to put some of this in action will you stand up all over this place will you turn around and face that area Come on, that south side of the building where those teenagers are standing right now, where those precious babies are standing. Will you reach out your hand over those precious ones? Let's pray a prayer of protection over them. In the name of Jesus, would you protect our babies? Would you keep them safe from the enemy's attacks? Would you keep them safe from the enemy's temptations? Would they stand when everybody else begins to fall? Would they be the light in the darkness? Would you help them, God, to be the light in the darkness? Would you teach them your word and, and help them hide it in their hearts, Lord? Would you help them, God? Would you help them, God? Lord, we pray protection over our babies. We pray protection over them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in agreement with me, say amen. amen. It, you may not know this, but I have my own boys' small group I run on Wednesday nights. And it's, uh, it's called Vortex. It's the Vortex Boys. Vortex for life. We got our own handshakes. We got our own little, we do snacks. They don't like my snack options because the other small group leaders, they're bringing them, like they're cooking pizzas, they're ordering out, like they're bringing in chicken, and, and I got fudge rounds and chips, baby. <laughs> and they know a couple things in the Vortex. Let me just pull the curtain back and tell you. Here's a couple things in the Vortex small group. You don't get any snacks unless you answer Bible questions first. The more Bible questions you answer, the more snacks that you get. And so I ask a lot of questions and I make some of them super hard because some of the boys have been around long enough now that they, they can tell you how many books are in the Bible, what are the two divisions of the Bible called, what language was the Old Testament written, name the first five books of the Bible. And my son Micah, I really give him a hard time. I mean, his last time his question was, what are all 66 books of the Bible? And he looked at me, I'm going, seriously, he goes, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Joseph, Ephraim, Seven, 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 Six, Kings, Four, Six, Nine, Nine, Ezra, Nehemiah, Three, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Eclipse, Psalms, 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 Psalms. Do you have to do the New Testament too? Yes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, First. <laughs> so that that's the first thing about the vortex. You got to answer Bible questions. The second thing is that when the vortex boys go up to their room, they must stand straight at attention behind their chair until I walk in the room. They have to look straight forward. So I walk in, I come around them, and I go, it smells like stinky boys in here. And I try to get them to laugh, and they're trying not to laugh, and they start smirking, and then somebody makes a little toot noise or something, and we all start laughing. <laughs> but then we do the Vortex Pledge. And the Vortex Pledge says, I am a Christian boy. 
and they repeat after me. I'm a leader, not a follower. I put God first in everything I do. I honor my parents, leaders, and authority. I learn God's word and hide it in my heart. I forgot the rest. I learn God's word and hide it in my heart. And then we say, I am Vortex. We have to pray protection over our kids. We have to pray protection over our minds. You can wake up every morning and just visualize building a wall of protection. Just like Nehemiah rebuilt the walls. We need to be able to build the walls, the spiritual walls around our homes in Jesus' name. Amen. So we pray for protection. And number six, the Lord's prayer ends with proclamation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What are we doing? We're asking God to speak to us because we're listening. We're asking him to answer in his time on a, in a perfect, in his perfect will and seal the prayer with his name of Jesus. Amen. This then is how you should pray. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Praise to his name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your mission accomplished. Not the movie. Number three, provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Number four, forgiveness and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Number five, protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then number six, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Proclamation. This is how we pray. But how do we pray effectively? Because although anybody can pray, not all prayers hold the same effectiveness. This is going to challenge some of your thinking. Please do not push snooze on what I'm about to show you in God's Word. I'm going to show you very clearly what God says about effective prayers. Because not everybody's prayers are at the same effectiveness level. How many have prayed and you're really hoping and believing and praying that whatever you prayed is going to come through and be effective. I'm the only one? Okay, okay, I thought so. So when we pray, we want our prayers to make a difference. But there are some things that if we aren't doing, our prayers will not be effective. This is going to shock some of you. But please listen to what God's Word says. I'm going to highlight very clearly what God's Word says about effective prayers. Are you ready? I'll wait till you are. Are you ready? Yes. Let's look at your life as a prayer warrior. Not just somebody who prays, but somebody who prays effectively. Somebody who makes an impact. How do we make sure that your prayers make an impact? I'm going to give you some numbers here. Write this down. Number one, this is scripture. Listen to this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. Make, let's make this very clear. This is not me saying it. This is God's word. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The Lord will not hear me. Are you seeing this? Number two, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, who is going to go to where God is and see effective prayer or be where God can do something? Who is going to be that person? He that hath clean hands and a what? Pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor in sworn deceitfully. That's Psalms 24, 3 and 4. Listen to this one. Number three, if you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done 
unto you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done. The word if is very important, isn't it? This is not a guarantee. This is a if. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done unto you. Let me show you in scripture this last portion. And then I'm going to get you to the altar and God is going to change your perspective on prayer with this one word. Look at this. In all the teaching on prayer, there's only one subject matter that Jesus revisits. Okay, are you ready for this? Say, I'm ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. I said, are you ready for this? Are you sure? Some of you, your toes are going to get stepped on it and I'm going to pinpoint some area in your life that you need to work on is going to hurt but it's going to help you as you know my mother went through a surgery an emergency procedure just a couple of weeks ago and she is still in pain it still hurts but it's better for her so allow me in the most kind way possible to hurt you today <laughs> how was church today well the pastor hurt me real good <laughs> I'm not trying to hurt you to hurt you. I'm trying to hurt you to help you. Are you hearing me today? All right. I think you might be ready. Let's look at God, the Lord's Prayer again, and then we're going to finish off the last two verses. I know you've heard it a lot, but you can hear it again. It's not going to kill you. Our Father in heaven, let's, let's hold our fingers up to the commands that Jesus tells us, okay? The, the way we pray. Number one, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your king. Okay. Your kingdom come. That's number two. This is verse 10, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number three, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, and number four, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Number five, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one and the proclamation for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Six things highlighted in Jesus' prayer. But if you continue to read in verse 14, Jesus revisits one area of the six things he says. He revisits only one area. He does not go back and say, and we pray again about give us this day. He does not go back and say, we're going to pray again for, for God's kingdom to come. No, no. He goes back in verse 14 through 15, and he says this. So it just finishes. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who uh, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Continued, it says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespassers, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. If you do not forgive those who did you wrong, God will not forgive you. I told you it would hurt. Years ago, my, pa my pastor, my dad was preaching this message and a man after service came up to him and said, Pastor, I must have misheard you. I was, I was trying to pay attention. I must have misheard what you said. Did you, did you say, I know I didn't hear this right, but did you say that if I don't forgive people, God's not going to forgive me? Did you say that? And my dad said, no, I didn't say that. God said that in his word. Wait a minute. This goes against the nice, kind, Jesus makes everybody happy. Jesus is not here to make you happy. This goes against the TikTok version of Jesus that this generation is believing, thinking that they can just be okay. If I just, I can live my life, I don't gotta, I don't gotta confirm, I don't gotta uh, conform to the, uh, to, to God's will. Uh, I can just conform to the pattern of this world. I don't need to be trans, I don't need to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I, I, I'm good, I'm good. No, this goes against everything that we have been 
uh, taught by our culture to believe. I know this is hard. This is tricky. But this is God's word. Let me give you some more scripture. Matthew chapter 18, 21. Jesus tells a whole story about this. We're going to put it up on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. Follow along with me in your own Bible if you have it. Matthew 18, verse 21. If you have that up there, put it up there for me, please. It says this. They're working on it up there. It's the story, I can paraphrase. It's the parable of the ungrateful servant. It's the story of the ungrateful servant. And this, let me just paraphrase. Oh, do we have it? Yeah, we have it. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often? How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. You've heard this before. And Jesus says, no. Not, I do not say seven times, but 70 times seven. Some of you are doing the math, and you're going, okay, I got it. I'm going to start making some tally marks. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's uh, such a high number you shouldn't even worry about. You should continue to forgive them. And then Jesus goes along to tell the story. And it's this. In verse 23, he says this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So what does he do? When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Some translation says 10,000 gold pieces. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be, uh, oh, we skipped the verse, I think. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you're good. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and that way the payment could be made. So the guy owes the king. The king, he says, God, uh, king, I don't have any money. He says, okay, we're going to sell you as a slave. We're going to sell your kids. We're going to sell your wife. Then we'll call it even. The servant, therefore, fell down before him and said, master, have patience with me, please, and I will pay you all. I will take care of it. Please have patience. The master of that servant was moved with compassion. Everybody say compassion. He realized, uh, he released him and forgave him his debt. 10,000 gold coins, you're forgiven. Don't worry about it. Never mind. But that same servant fell, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred Denarii. Somebody, one uh, translation says 100 silver coins. He owed 10,000 gold. Now he found somebody that owed him 100 silver. This is so interesting to me. Verse 29, listen to this. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay it all to you. I know I owe you a hundred silver coins. Please be patient with me. I promise I will give it to you. And you would think this man who was just forgiven of this tremendous debt just said, You know what, buddy? I'm just April Fool in you. No big deal. It's forgotten. My debt was forgotten. No, that's not what this man does. What does he do in verse 31, it says this, and he would not but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. Threw him into prison until he could pay his debt. One translation says, he grabbed him by the neck. Here's what scripture is telling you today. When you do not have a clear handle on what God has done for you, it makes your ability to forgive others very difficult. And when you are unwilling to forgive others, your prayers cannot be heard. Is that really what it says? Matthew 18, 35. That's what my heavenly father will do if you do not refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Ephesians 4, 32 says, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, Christ, God in Christ forgave you. Let me read this again. 
Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will the heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. This is red letters. This is what Jesus is saying. Will you all over this place stand to your feet? We're going to get dismissing in just a moment. We're just going to take a praise break. But stand to your feet all over the place. Ms. Joy can, uh, whoever's, yeah, Ms. Joy, come up. I was like, who's playing Pia? Thank you for letting me preach at you today. We're not done yet. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. I'm going to give you a real practical step here. But first, I want you to take a second, and I want you to think about the sin in your life, what God has restored you and redeemed you from. And this should be a big praise break because some of us have forgotten the mess that we were in. And when I ask you to lift up a praise break, I want it to be a big one because God has delivered you from a whole lot. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of all of our mess. And we praise you now with a large praise break. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah! 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 woo Thank you, Lord. All right, sit down. I'm going to give you some three, a uh, couple of really practical steps to write down. Please don't skip out of here yet. I know our bus teams are leaving because they got to take a bunch of kids home. They're the only ones that are allowed to leave. Unless you're getting on a bus to help them, then you can go too. They're parked out there. Ride bus number six or eight. Which one that you pick? Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. If I had a bottle of water up here, who's thirsty in this place? I got to, who's thirsty? Come on, seriously, I'm just going to give you a drink. Who's thirsty? Come on. I know somebody's thirsty up in here. Jesse's thirsty. Erica, I'm picking on you today. Come on. Will I embarrass you too bad if I if I pick on you? Come up here, Miss Erica. I'm so proud of her. She's been coming for a few time, for a few weeks now. She's about the point now to be embarrassed. She's come up long enough. She's like, I didn't sign up for this. All right, Miss Erica, I'm going to give you that water. You can open it, take a drink. And uh, oh, wait, one quick thing. I did take just a eye drop of toilet water and just just a little bit. It's not a whole lot, Miss Erica. It's not a ton. It's just a little bit of, of water from a, a used toilet. Would you drink it? No, she would not. How many are, are like, yes, I would not drink that. There's no way. Yeah, we would all say that. And I really didn't put one toilet water in there. You can actually drink. She's like, it touched my tongue already. <laughs> you said it too late. She's like freaking out. Thank you. That's all. You did it. She survived her first time being called out. Awesome. Yeah, give her a hand. That's great. That's what bitter water is. It's just a little bit that has been regular water that has been tainted or poisoned. And so Naomi comes back and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because I am now bitter. I have been made bitter. And what unforgiveness does, it takes somebody so healthy and clean before the Lord and it causes them to become bitter. And bitter in such a way that they are no longer useful to the kingdom. Their prayers no longer have impact because they have been made bitter. They have been made bitter. That's what unforgiveness does. I realize in a group this size on a Sunday morning, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of us in this room that something or someone has done something to you that you have had 
to forgive them. Am I the only one that's had to forgive somebody of something? Or have you had to forgive somebody? But I also realize in a room this size with this many people, there are many of us who have not forgiven. And the reality is, you know you ought to. And it is not that you don't want to. It's that you don't know how to forgive them. Some of you need to forgive your father from 40 years ago. Some of you need to forgive your husband from 40 days ago. Some of you need to forgive yourself 40 minutes ago. There's something so powerful about forgiving yourself because here's what happens. You make a bad call, you do something wrong, which brings some consequence to your life. That consequence is painful. But what's even more painful is that you realize that I cannot be trusted. I made the wrong call. I did this to myself. So then you have to go through the process. This sounds so like new agey. I'm not trying to be weird. This is not yoga. But what I'm talking about is the process of forgiving yourself. I made the wrong call. I ate the wrong things. I did the I hung out with the wrong people. I made a bad decision and now I have to learn to forgive myself. Forgiveness is something that has to be learned. I'm going to give you four steps really quick and then we're going to pray. How do I forgive? I'm telling you write this down. This is going to help somebody here. How do I forgive? Number 1. You must remember who forgave you first. You have to remember who forgave you first. There is nothing, listen to me, church, there's nothing that anybody has ever done to you that is worse than what you have done to our Heavenly Father. You have, you had your sins, your selfishness, your anger, your fill in the blank. That hurt Jesus' heart more than anybody else could have hurt you. You have hurt Jesus. Then he's on the cross, and what does he say? Father, forgive them. He took your sins. He took your pain. He took your bad decisions. He took your bad habits. He took your addictions. He took your anger and your bad thought life and your all of those things he took them on his shoulders you heard my savior but he forgave you so number one you got to remember who gave, forgave you first number two you have to realize forgiving them is not for them forgiving them is not for them it's for you Forgiving them does not say what happened was okay. It was not okay. What they did to you, the way they made you feel, how they hurt you, how they cut you deep, that was not okay, friend. I'm not saying that what they did to you is okay. It's not okay. But forgiveness is like releasing that to the Lord. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping it kills the other guy, but it kills you. You have to realize forgiving them is not for them. It's releasing you. You are in a bondage. You are in a chain of unforgiveness. You need to be set free. It's not setting them free. It's setting you free. Number three, you have to recognize that forgiveness is a daily choice that you make. Well, I don't really feel like forgiving them. I don't care what you feel like, honey cakes. It's not about how you feel. It is about so much. We get, we get so confused with so much of the kingdom stuff that we feel like it's about a feeling. I worship when I feel like it. I pray when I feel like it. I read God's word when I feel like it. I walk through the meadow with Jesus when I feel like it. It is not about a feeling. It's about choices. We choose to forgive 
every day. When you're first cut, it hurts. It hurts bad. I got lots of doctor friends and medical people over here. Hey, all you my doctor people up here. Hey, when people get cut, does it hurt? Yeah. If they get cut and it happened 100 years ago, does it still hurt? No. Is there still a scar? Oh, yeah. Scars are still there. They don't hurt no more. You've been cut, and now you carry a scar. I got a scar on my knee from when I crashed my bike on the gravel driveway back, back, back when I was a kid. I tell everybody I got bit by a shark. I say it was a small shark because, no, I'm kidding. But when it happened, it was like the devil himself took his little pitchfork and stabbed through my, I mean, it hurt. But it don't hurt no more. It's still there, but now it's just a story to tell, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Some of us still carry wounds of past hurt. You're still carrying that wounded. But every day when you get up and you make a decision and you say out loud, I forgive them, even when you don't feel like it, it gets easier. It gets easier to forgive them. It gets easier when you do it every day. So, number one, we remember who forgave us first. Number two, we realize forgiving them is not for them. Number three, we recognize that forgiveness is a daily choice. And number four, we renew our minds so bitter to, bitterness does not set in. And we read that in Ruth. She wanted to change her name to Mara, which means bitter standing all over this place. No one's leaving, no one's talking, no one's moving around. We're gonna turn our attention now from each other to heaven. I want your prayers to be effective. I want the Lord to hear your prayers. I want him to heal you and touch you and help you. But if you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, he will not hear your words. This is not me saying this. This is God's word. You have sin in your life. You haven't asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, or you have, but it's been a long time. And you know you are not where you need to be with God, and you want to give your life to Jesus right now. I don't want to call you out, embarrass you. I'm not going to make you confess your sins over the microphone to everybody, but I do want to pray with you. If that's you and you know that I'm talking directly to you, you know who you are. When no one looking around, heads down, eyes are closed, I've got to get my relationship with Jesus on track starting right this second. If that's you, will you just slip up your hand and get my attention so I know who you are? Where are you at? I see you up there, sis. I see you back there, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, I see you up there. Yeah. Who else? Wow, who else? i got to get my relationship with God on track starting right now. I see you. I see you. Yeah, brother. Today's your day. Transformation takes place. Who else? Anybody else? Amen. Amen. In fact, I'm going to do things a little different. I, I don't want to embarrass you, but if that was you, I want you to raise your hand and keep it up this time because I have some prayer friends of mine, and they're going to come up to you and just pray with you right there in your seat. But they need to know who you are so they can find you. So if that's you, you just lift up your hands. There's about four or five of you. Will you just keep your hand up? If you're on one of my prayer teams, will you just go and find them right now, somebody with their hand up? We got a couple. Identify where you're at so I know. I got somebody coming to you up there. I got you up there. She's coming up to see you, sis, up there in the balcony. Thank you. They're going to just begin to pray with you and minister to you. The rest of us in the room, nobody else is looking, heads down, our eyes are closed. 